Hi, everyone. So I would like to know, I know that you thought for years about doing this book yes. before you eventually dove in. What gave you that final push? Partially you. <laughs> um, it's true. I wrote a book five years ago called Talking With My Mouth Full, and it wasn't a cookbook. It was a story of sort of how I found my space and place in the food world um, at this crossroads of food and popular culture that seems to be having this extraordinary moment in all of our lives and sort of the path I took to get there. And it took me a while after I wrote that book to recover from writing the book. And I did some other things. I had a mm -hmm. child. And, and then about two years ago, two and a half years ago, I had this pile of notebooks that I'd been keeping in my desk in my, in my home. And every six months, my husband would take the notebooks out and ask me to throw them out. But I refused. And the notebooks were covered in notes and recipes and scribbles and doodles from all of my travels over the last, well, really 10, 15 years of my life. Everything I'd eaten on almost every travel or trip I'd gone on, especially my travels abroad. And I'd always noted them written everything down, flavor combinations that inspired me, interesting places I visited, recipes that I loved, and filed them away. And about two and a half years ago, I decided it's probably time to actually dust them off and see if there was something there. And so I started writing them down in one sort of amalgamated list and realized I had over a hundred ideas of things that I wanted to cook or things that I'd already been cooking and I'd already sort of implemented into my home kitchen and that it was time to share them with the world. And that's how Bringing It Home oh. came about. Oh, wow. And how do you distill all of those experiences with chefs and traveling into, into a cohesive book? It was easier than I thought mm -hmm. in some ways because we all, you know, we all have adventures all over the world and we, mm -hmm. and we eat and we drink every day, many times a day, actually. And I thought that it actually came more easily to me than I thought to write down the list of things that I love to cook that were inspired by times in my life, trips that I've taken, some as early as when I was in childhood. Not all of the recipes are from the last 20 years of my life while I've been working in the food industry. Many of them are memories of food that I love, that I remember really nostalgically from you know, my history, even when I was four, five, six years old, things we ate as children. Mm -hmm. But all of it I've taken and twisted through the lens of a professional cook and made the recipes, adapted them, twisted them, evolved them a little bit so that they are not just the same dish that we all eat every day when we're a child, but made them a little more interesting, given them some really solid cooking technique and improved upon them, I think, so that they are ready to be put into a book. And I think that they differentiate themselves from others. And I think a really nice thing you do is you also give nods to those chefs that have influenced you along the way. Whether through, I think you call it chef text, yes. right? Um, can you talk about that approach? I think you once described the book to me as a love letter to chefs and how you've incorporated their advice, but also uniquely making it your own. I. I've been very lucky in my life through my work at Food Wine Magazine, through my work on Top Chef over the last 12 years of making the show, and you know my work when I was at culinary school as a student, and then working as a line cook in the restaurants here in New York that I worked in for many years, as well as the experiences I've had working sort of and traveling around the world. I've spent a lot of time with chefs, cooking with them, eating with them, hanging out in airports for travel delays with them, sitting at the Top Chef judges table with them. And I've been able to spend a lot of time just learning from them, writing down ideas, suggestions, and really bringing those ideas home. And I think that they have made me a better cook. Mm -hmm. The way that I think about food, I mean, obviously I have professional training and I cooked in restaurants and, and I've been working in the food industry for almost 20 years, but Taking all those lessons home, I think, aren't, isn't something that people think about. You know, people think of a chef as a chef, and then a home cook as a home cook. But really, the same lessons apply in both kitchens, just pared down a little bit or twisted in a, in a certain way. Mm -hmm. And I wanted home cooks to be empowered with that information and understand that all of the lessons that we talk to our chefs on Top Chef about, for example, or all of the things I've learned while talking to great cooks around the world 
can all be brought home to your kitchen and ultimately will make you a better cook if you take the time to understand the foundation of cooking um, and to understand sort of simple techniques, tools, and ideas about flavor that I think really impact the way that we all cook and eat. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to pay tribute to that in my book. And there's a number of recipes that are tributes to chefs that I've worked with over the years. They're not recipes from those chefs. They are recipes that either came up from an adventure that I had with one of the chefs that was really memorable or a lesson that one of the chefs taught me. I'll give you an example. Um, Tom Colicchio, my co-judge on Top Chef, is a huge fisherman. And so we've fished together many times over the years and we have spent literally countless hours sitting beside each other at the judges table or out for dinner while we're on the road shooting the show. And one technique that I know he loves that I've cooked with him before and that he really loves to teach people is salt baking, salt baking fish. So you take a whole fish or you can use a filet, but it always works best with a whole piece of fish and you cover it in a mixture of salt and egg whites that kind of makes it into almost like a, a, a clay-like consistency and you pat it down and pack it all over the fish and bake the fish in the oven and it doesn't make the fish salty at all because the skin provides a barrier but it steams the fish and cooks it so beautiful and when you take it out of the oven it's this gorgeous golden crust of salt that you break into and you have this beautiful cooked piece of fish and I know how much he loves cooking that way so in my book I have a recipe that's really a an ode to Tom um, where I cook a big whole pe a whole branzino with lemon and fennel and, and fennel seeds and citrus and it's all sort of baked in this fish for Tom. Oh, that sounds so good. It's simple, it sounds difficult, but it's actually one of the simplest ways to cook fish and it's almost completely impossible to screw it up. Good. It's good to do at home. Speaking of difficult, I mean, writing a book especially with this many recipes. How many recipes are there? A little over 100, I think maybe like 105, I mean, 107. That's a lot, that's a very difficult feat, just logistically, yeah. creatively. I mean, it, it two years, it, took, it takes two years to write a cookbook, which sort of is amazing. I mean, my husband loved to remind me that they filmed like four Star Wars movies in the time that it took me to write my book. Oh. But, but yeah. that's the time it takes. I mean, when you think about, you know, a book, being printed and photographed. I mean, there's so many components. So yes, it took a lot of my life. Yeah. How does it feel? I mean, also a lot of your life where Dolly has been growing up. How does it? How does she have really an understanding of that process? And now this that this is Gail's daughter. Yes, a, yeah. a little <laughs> bit. You know, when I first started working on the book, she was two or just about to turn two, and now she's about to turn four. Um, there's pictures of her in the book which were taken during the photography stage of the book when she was three. And there's a lot of recipes in there that were really informed by me now having to cook for a family, not just cook for myself and my husband. And so that definitely impacts it. She does have an idea because when I finally brought the book home, the first copy of the book that my publisher sent me, I brought it home to her and I put it down and I was speaking to a friend of mine was over and my husband and I said, I did it, I finished it. And now anytime, someone comes to the house and sees the book, she says, mommy finished it, oh. I finished her book, look, here it is. So, yeah. it, but it is amazing, uh, the process. It feels great to have it done. It's, it, books are so inspirational to me and so important in my life, cookbooks for sure. I have a huge collection and they're such a constant source of inspiration to me, having this tangible piece of work that really is full of recipes that I use mm -hmm. and having it out in the universe is an extraordinary feeling. I delicious. cooked the burrata pasta. It was lovely. I saw that. It was great. Thank you. <laughs> it's pretty delicious. Oh my god, very it was, satisfying. It was so good. Oh, I was like pulling apart the cheese and watching it melt. It was. Mm -hmm. It was great. And also, it didn't involve so many ingredients. It was like easy to shop for. It felt like. I mean, I thought of you. I thought like you just, you thought you, you got it that I didn't have a full day or mm -hmm. want to be prepping for all day, but it was actually really impressive and beautiful to put down. There's a, a balance I try to strike in bringing it home between this isn't a, re this isn't a cookbook of like four ingredients, 20 minutes, you can make anything. And it's sort of, um, you know, these are not dumbed down recipes in any way. But they're also not chefy chef recipes where you read the recipe and realize that there's 14 sub recipes and you have to go to the back of the book to find the sub recipes to then even begin making the main recipe. Mm -hmm. And it takes a week and then there's like a fermenting process thrown in the middle. So I didn't want either of those things. I wanted recipes that are practical, 
that are for the home cook, first and foremost, that people will use and implement into their life, put them in the weekly rotation. Some of them require a little more doing. Some of them are a little bit more involved. There's a few pickle recipes that you need to let sit and pickle for a while. There's a recipe uh, for beet cured salmon, which is so simple, but it does take three days, but you literally put it in your fridge for three days, forget about it. So you do it on Thursday and you're ready for Sunday brunch. Um, so, so there's a couple of recipes that are much more involved, but ultimately I wanted every recipe to feel intuitive so that when you read it, you weren't necessarily having to follow the recipe and, and get confused by all the different steps, but that it felt like this is something that you could make a few times and then you would just get it. And not only would you get it, you would then be able to make your own spin on it. So the recipe that you made specifically had burrata and lemon and Swiss chard and orchiette pasta. That was my Canadian in me coming out, by the way. <laughs> pasta. Pasta. But, you know, if you didn't find, couldn't find Swiss chard, it would be just as great with kale. And if you didn't find those, you could absolutely, or if you couldn't find burrata, you could absolutely make it with mozzarella. Um, or, you know, do twists on it however you please mm -hmm. and make it your own. Yes. So I guess the question now, would you do this again? Oh, goodness. <laughs> Not tomorrow. Yeah. Um, but I, of course I would, I actually have to say, I loved the process. It in a way was less stressful to me than my first book because cookbooks, although they differ and can go in many different directions, there is sort of a roadmap to writing a cookbook. And I loved how, um, like methodical it was. Mm -hmm. You know, we were in the kitchen for four months, pretty much, but every day we would just tackle three recipes at a time. And then we, once we'd done them all, we tested them all, we gave them, you know, we swapped. I was working with a, a good friend of mine and I would develop them all and then she would test them all or a few she developed and swapped over to me. So I loved that rhythm and it also made me a better cook because it forced me to just focus down and for four months straight just be in my own kitchen, which is something I haven't had a chance to do in a long time. Mm -hmm. So I came away with a lot of good skills and ideas for another one. Good. And I know Top Chef comes back in December. Yes. I'm sure we have many fans in the audience. Colorado. Yes, Colorado. All over the state. We go to oh, Denver, wow. Boulder, Telluride, Aspen. Um, a lot of beautiful, kind of majestic, unbelievable locations everywhere in between. Can you tease anything about this upcoming season? Well, it starts December 7th, premieres December 7th. Um, you know, the interesting thing about being Colorado, which is different, I think, than a lot of the cities we've shot in before. Usually we, sh we shoot in a city, or if we go to a state and do multiple cities, they're much more urban environments. Mm -hmm. But Colorado being the state that it is, it just lends itself to a different kind of cooking in a way that we didn't anticipate, actually, I think. We spend so much time in the outdoors. We were there in May, and Colorado in May is not a given. It's not just spring. I mean, the first elimination challenge we did, within three minutes of finishing the challenge, there was a biblical proportion hailstorm. <gasps> I mean, golf balls that covered the city of Denver. It was kind of unbelievable to see. And two days later, it snowed a foot and a half in the mountains. And we had to go out for an outdoor cooking challenge with our chefs. And they were literally walking through a foot and a half, two feet of snow. So that makes you think on your feet. And then a month later, we, when we were still shooting, it was 75 degrees and gorgeous and sunny. And of course, you're so high up in the altitude that your cooking has to change because yeah. cooking at altitude is a totally different thing. Water boils at a very different temperature. Dough rises in a very different way. It's a very, very challenging. If you, even if you are the best chef in the world, have never cooked at altitude, you really have to rethink the way you cook. And so that was an incredible thing to watch. And our chefs, they just killed it. They just did such a great job. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Have you seen, I'm curious, is the show, is this the 12th season? It's the 15th, 15th season. Right. It's the 12th year, but okay. 15th season. I knew season. there was a 12th in there. Yeah, yeah. How do you see the talent, is the, is the talent keep, does it change year to year as the show grows in popularity? Like, like who do you see it attracting now that's coming in? I mean, I think what's remarkable about Top Chef, this is not an amateur cooking show. It's not a show yes. about people who think it would be cool to be a chef. These are professionals. They've all been working as cooks and chefs for at least a decade but by the time they get to us. So although our audience thinks that they're all overnight successes, it's actually not the case at all. They've all paid their dues and then some. So what I think is amazing, and I really 
have to say this is our casting department, is that every year the talent seems to get stronger and more interesting. And I say more interesting, not just that they are more talented, because they are, and they're, they, every year the cooks that come on are stronger and stronger. But more than that, they're so diverse, and they have such, such interesting points of view, such different perspectives on the world and the way they cook. And that's what I think keeps the show really exciting. Mm -hmm. Because we're not just eating food by 15 chefs who are exactly the same, who cook French or American food. We have chefs from all over the world, all different backgrounds, and they all bring such different food. You know, we had an amazing Vietnamese chef this season and uh, a chef from Pakistan and, uh, you know, chefs from Italy, chefs from all over the States. So it's just amazing to see what they bring to us and every dish is totally different. And that's kind of exciting. If you think about the fact that we probably get, I don't know, 5,000 applications every season and it's whittled down to these 15 people. And it's not just about who's the best cook because ultimately this is television. It has to actually be fun to watch. And if, if cooks just put their heads down and cooked without speaking or showing any personality, we would all be bored and turn the channel. And so what I think is brilliant is the chemistry between them and how they all are just fascinating people. Their narratives are so great and they really get us invested in who they are. Is there a particular success story that you feel attached to, seeing someone graduate? All of them. I'm amazed at the success of the chefs that have come through Top Chef. If you think about any reality show, actually, New York Magazine once did an article about the success rates of different reality shows and the results of winners or contestants after the fact. And Top Chef was the number one because, I mean, granted, it's much harder to get a recording contract than it is, let's say, to open a restaurant. But the number of chefs on our show who have gone on to open successful restaurants, write books, have their own television shows, multiple empires, um, is sort of staggering. I think they've changed the economy of America. Oh. I really, I'm, of the restaurant industry in America um, and the way that we all eat. Every city that people go to, you can, you know, if you think of everyone from Stephanie Izard in Chicago to Carla Hall here at the Chew in New York mm -hmm. to, um, I mean, the list goes on and on. Richard Blaze, Michael Voltaggio, and I'm not talking just about winners. Um, you know, anyone on Top Chef, even, you know, some of the ones that have wrote it off early have just gone on to great success and done amazing things. They've really changed our industry. It's amazing. Yeah. Good. On that note, let's open it up to the audience for questions. Hi, Gail. Hi. Um, so each season on Top Chef, you guys go to a different location, each with its own unique culinary roots. What was yes. your personal favorite location to uh. share? Um, we've, we've been able to do so much traveling. I should say I'm Canadian. So when I first moved to the States almost 20 years ago, I actually hadn't been to a lot of America before. Um, I'd been to California and New York and Florida. Um, I'd been to New Mexico because my brother went to school there, but there was almost all of this country that I hadn't seen before. So being on the show has really allowed me to get to know all of these cities. Um, I would say my favorite season for a location for a whole season was New Orleans. Such an extraordinary corner of the universe. The culture is so rich, the food is so unique. And I was totally blown away by the community there and the history of the city and how all of it influenced the way that the people there eat and the rich, rich traditions that they hold. I thought it was amazing. I would say that was probably my favorite city. Hi, Gail. Hi. Um, what was it like collaborating with Mindy Fox? And can you talk a little bit about the cake recipe that's on the cover? Oh, sure. Uh, Mindy is one of my best friends of 20 years. Uh, we met like maybe the second year that I moved to New York. And we met, she was a food writer, and she was actually doing a lot of nonprofit work for sustainable agriculture at the time. And she had been an editor at Sever. She went on to be the food editor at La Cucina Italiana. And she's written four or five books of her own, of her own and also for other chefs before. So there was no one else I would turn to than Mindy um, because doing something with your best friend makes it so much easier. So it was a treat. You know, you're a little also nervous going into business, so to speak, with a good friend. That was a concern when we first started working on the project together. But she's such a pro and we created such a great system. She was just able to really manage me and my time because 
writing the cookbook isn't the only thing that I do in my business. And I'm away for several months of the year shooting the show and working on other projects. So she was just awesome at wrangling me, getting me to focus, and just kicking my butt in the kitchen and making sure we got it all done and done on time and done it done at a standard that I was so grateful for. You know, she really made sure that every detail was covered and she's, she's awesome. I wouldn't ever imagine doing a book without her again. Um, the cake on the cover is not actually a cake. It's a spaghetti pie, uh, which you should make. It's in the book. It was a recipe that came to me, not in the initial creation of the table of contents, um, but was one of the recipes that I developed sort of halfway through the process and became sort of my triumph without knowing it. It's that sort of thing that seemed ridiculous to make, but I loved it so much that I had to put it in. And then I can't tell you how many people have made it and told me that it's, you know, the craziest, most ridiculous, delicious thing they've ever eaten. And then, of course, it ended up on the cover, which is sort of funny. The story of it is that when I was 19 years old, I spent a summer in Australia and New Zealand. I was uh, bartending and, and waitressing. And then we were in Australia. I was in Australia for a month or two. And then I went to New Zealand. I was with my, my college roommate. And we traveled through New Zealand and we were backpacking. We had no money. And every truck stop that we would stop at or gas station or you know little side of the road in the middle of rural New Zealand restaurant, all had spaghetti sandwiches on the menu. I don't know if they still do, and I know that their culinary scene has improved much in the last 25 years, but we were obsessed with these spaghetti sandwiches. They were sort of like pressed, sealed paninis stuffed with tomato and overcooked spaghetti, which sounds disgusting, but when you're 19 and hungry and they cost $2 and it's like the double carb deliciousness, they were great. And so we would eat them and think they were hilarious. And so I wanted to pay tribute to these hilarious spaghetti sandwiches that we ate and was trying to think of a more interesting way to do that, but something that was kid friendly and sort of great on a budget. And I came up with this spaghetti pie, which is spaghetti that is then tossed with spicy or sweet sausage, broccoli or broccoli rob, lots of cheese and fresh tomato sauce and mixed all together and then baked in the oven and you sprinkle it with fresh sage and Parmesan cheese. And it comes out, I mean, it weighs like 47 pounds and it feeds an army of human beings. Or it can just be for you and you can eat it every day for 10 days and be so perfectly happy. It makes the best leftovers ever. And so it just became sort of my favorite recipe in the book. Uh, hi. Hi. Uh, healthy eating, uh, especially in like maybe low income areas. Uh, how how difficult is it? Do you think sometimes to find like healthy ingredients and and uh, or expensive? Uh, and also, is it hard sometimes to balance taste with uh, like you know what's healthy? Right. Um, it's true. I you know I I've spent a lot of my time. Uh, working with some organizations here in New York and then across the country, specifically for children in underserved neighborhoods. Uh, sadly, in this country, there are a lot of parts of, uh, there's a lot of parts of this country where people do not have the access to fresh ingredients that we all are lucky enough to have here in New York, and even parts of New York, by the way, um, where there's food deserts. There's a lot of not only food that is extraordinarily expensive in terms of accessing fresh food, but they just cannot literally get it where they need it. And that's not an issue of the fact that there aren't, it's not, a, it's not an issue of the fact that there isn't enough food in this country. There is plenty of food to go around. We are one of the richest countries in the world. It's an issue of distribution and access. And that actually, truthfully, can only really change at the policy level, at the governmental level because the government subsidizes things that are a lot cheaper to make, and so that's what is cheap to buy in the grocery store, and things like fresh vegetables and fruit are much more expensive because they're not subsidized crops. It's a whole other discussion maybe for another time. In the meantime, what can we do? And this is upsetting to me because I feel so lucky in my life to be able to eat and have access to the kind of extraordinary food that I do. So um, helping those parts of the world, those families and underserved communities, especially children who are going to school hungry. And when you go to school hungry and you can't concentrate, then of course you can't perform well and you, 
you are given a handicap, uh, f you know, for learning and education. So, and that affects your entire life. So it is a, a very difficult problem uh, that we have all over the country, and it is very hard to balance healthy food with food that obviously tastes good and food that's going to fill you up. I mean, uh, whoever's the head of the household who's doing the grocery shopping, when you go to the grocery store and you have very little money to spend, you're going to go for the cheapest food that fills your children up, but that's not necessarily the healthiest food. So how do you strike that balance? And I think that there, you know, there's definitely ways to cook simply and use ingredients, simple things like canned beans and, um, you know, simple fruits and vegetables like carrots that can be less expensive or, um, you know, soup, making simple soups that can be stretched for, to be made throughout the week that are really important um, to try and teach people to, to do so that they are more empowered to, to use healthier ingredients. Um, but that also is an education process. So it's about getting into those communities and giving them the tools they need to make sure that they can stretch their dollar and that we can make sure that our children are fed. There you go. Thank you so much. And thank you to everyone for being here and for you for coming in. Of course, thank you. So nice to hear more about this. It's okay. a huge accomplishment. Thank you, it was a lot of fun. I'm very proud of it. Appreciate talking to you today. Okay. Thanks.